Hi there, my name's Bruce Rain from Brackus Creations, and this is the second follow up to my DIY ultrasonic cleaner video. This video is brought to you by channel sponsor PCB Way, but more on that in a moment. If you haven't seen my original video, please check it out here. It includes lots of info about what an ultrasonic cleaner is and how it works. Building my own ultrasonic cleaner seemed like a great idea, but I encountered lots of problems. I received numerous comments with suggestions, and I'll try and address as many as I can in this video. So just a quick recap. An ultrasonic cleaner uses emitters or transducers to emit ultrasonic sound, and those transducers need a driver to make them work. It's a bit like a speaker and an amplifier. A few of the comments suggested that using multiple ultrasonic transducers on the same frequency meant they were cancelling each other out. So my first follow-up video addresses this. Link up here. We have conclusively shown that this is not the case, so let's move on. My ultrasonic cleaner has four 120 watt ultrasonic drivers with each one powering two 50 watt transducers. I mentioned in the original video that I was having two main problems, the transducers detaching from the tank and the drivers overheating and failing. Let's look at the overheating first. One suggestion was to improve the cooling of these drivers by placing them into a smaller box with fans to create more targeted cooling. So I 3D printed a box, put two small 12 volt fans at one end and some vents at the other end, creating a wind tunnel. This was effective in bringing the operating temperature down, but I was still having failures, and some drivers were getting hotter than others. So I decided to try some different drivers. I found a new seller on AliExpress that sold transducers and drivers separately, so I bought a couple of drivers to test them out. When they arrived, they looked to be a much better quality than the ones I had been using. The design and assembly was far more polished, so I was feeling very optimistic. After installing the new drivers, I did a few clean cycles, just for five minutes at a time, then gradually increasing the cleaning time. I had barely started the testing when one of the new drivers failed. <laughs> Needless to say, I was very frustrated, so I got straight in touch with the seller. It was an interesting conversation as I was typing in English and they were typing in Chinese, with Google Translate in the middle. Having said that, they were very helpful and informative. They offered me a few reasons why the drivers may have failed. Wrong voltage, incorrect wiring, faulty transducers. Let's start with the voltage. The drivers were made for 220 volt AC and I was using 240 volts. Initially, they thought this might have been an issue, but after consultation with their engineers, they decided this was an unlikely cause. Incorrect wiring. After sending them photos of my wiring, they told me what I had always suspected. The transducers were wired backwards. Even though I had double checked with the previous seller and they had assured me it was wired correctly, it was actually wrong. I had positive wired to negative and negative wired to positive. Once again, the new seller concluded that this would probably not cause the drivers to fail. I fixed the wiring anyway. So that left one primary cause, faulty transducers. Before speaking to these sellers, I was already coming to a similar conclusion. I'd been monitoring the power consumption and temperature of the cleaner and had noticed that some of the drivers were using more power and getting hotter than the others. I then played around with the wiring and realized that it was actually specific transducers that were causing the heat and increased power consumption of the driver. So I asked them, how do I test to see if a transducer is faulty? That's easy. Make sure the cleaner is cold. Run it for one minute, then check to see if any of the transducers are warm. So that's what I did, and I found three transducers were getting warm while the others were completely cold. The warm transducers were the ones that had detached from the tank while it was running and were left running for some time while detached. I had then reattached them, but these events had caused irreparable damage. So all of my problems stem from one single issue, the transducers not staying stuck to the tank. And another really important lesson I have learned is that if a transducer does fall off mid clean, consider it done. Throw it away and replace it with a new one. So to recap again, 
I had used JB Weld epoxy adhesive to attach the transducers, but several of them fell off while in use. I then found out that the small bolt that had been included with the transducers was meant to be welded to the tank surface first, then the transducers were meant to be glued and screwed onto the little bolt. While I do have a welder, it's gasless MIG, and TIG welding is recommended. MIG would be very hard to do without blowing holes in the thin stainless steel tank. I received lots of suggestions from viewers on how to address the issue with the transducer adhesion. Some suggested placing a platform under the transducers to hold them up against the tank. But unfortunately, this isn't really an option, as it would reduce the efficiency of the transducers. Others suggested I drill a hole in the tank and then bolt them in place from the top. This would present some issues with sealing those holes properly, but it still sounded feasible. But I've never seen any other ultrasonic machines built this way, which makes me think there's probably a reason for it. I had a few people suggest that if welding wasn't an option, maybe silver soldering or brazing could be an option. More on that later. I asked the seller about attaching the transducers and they told me they use a specialised type of epoxy adhesive. They actually build ultrasonic cleaners as well as selling the parts and they make some seriously impressive looking units. As it turns out, they don't use the little bolts at all. They rely entirely on the strength of the epoxy. I asked if they could sell me some of the adhesive they use, but the complications associated with shipping these sorts of chemicals prevent them from doing so. But this did start me down the path of trying different options for attaching these transducers, and we'll be testing these in a moment. One of the reasons I initially chose JB Weld is its resistance to heat. But the truth is, these transducers really shouldn't be getting that hot anyway. If they are getting super hot, there's probably a problem somewhere. So instead of using JB Weld, I tried a high strength epoxy adhesive. It's supposed to be good for temps up to 80 degrees C, so I'm hoping that will be enough. Do you like to tinker, design and build your own projects? If so, you really should check out PCBWay for all your PCB prototyping needs. They are one of the most experienced PCB manufacturers in China, and they provide PCB assembly as well, all under the same roof. Their state-of-the-art factory also provides CNC machining, 3D printing, flexible PCs, injection molding, you name it. I get all of my PCBs from PCBWay because of their fast turnaround and low prices. But don't take my word for it. Check them out today and see for yourself. For my test experiment, I bought this little tank and then attached four transducers. The tank is made from the same stainless steel as the tank of my cleaner. The first transducer uses JB Weld only. The second uses high strength epoxy only. The third uses a welded bolt plus high strength epoxy. And the fourth uses a silver soldered bolt plus high strength epoxy. I plan to try and tear each of these off while measuring the level of force it took. I mentioned that I had the wrong sort of welding equipment, but I had a go at welding it anyway. I just used some small tacks, but I still managed to blow a hole in the thin stainless steel. Thankfully, I was able to weld a patch. All in all, I was reasonably happy with the end result. I also tried out silver soldering, which seemed to work quite well. The tank bulged quite a bit from the heat, which made it hard to get the bolt to stay still and stay flat. But I think this is something I'd get better at with practice. Thankfully, the bulge in the tank flattened to its original shape after cooling. It did leave a dark mark on the stainless steel, but that came off with just a light sand. So here is my little test tray. I've screwed it securely to this timber board and I'm going to apply gradually increasing force to each transducer and then use this crane scale to measure the amount of force applied at the breaking point. I have here three 20 litre tanks. When full of water, each will weigh around 20 kilograms. I will gradually fill each one with water until the transducer falls off and I'll record the weight at that breaking point. I strongly doubt they'll be able to take more than 60 kilograms, but if they do, I think we have to consider them pretty well stuck. Here's the first test. The transducer stuck on with JB Weld. After just 15.8 kilograms of force, it gave way. And one of the tanks bounced up and whacked me in the shin. The second test is the transducer stuck on with high strength epoxy adhesive.
This one lasted until 29.3 kilograms, almost twice as strong as the JB Weld. For the next test, we have the transducer that has a welded bolt, as well as the high strength epoxy adhesive. At 36.6 kilograms, the glue cracked, but the transducer stayed on. After filling the tanks to capacity, a total of 72 kilograms of weight, the transducer was still on there. I let it sit for a while, then decided to remove the weight and go on to the next transducer. For the last test, we have the transducer with a silver soldered bolt, as well as the high strength epoxy adhesive. At 25.4 kilograms, the glue cracked, but once again, the transducer stayed on. And once again, the transducer stayed on with the full 72 kilograms of weight. I realize this isn't the most scientific of experiments, but it does show a few things. Firstly, JB Weld is really not the best product for this task. Secondly, the high strength epoxy adhesive seems to be able to handle 25 to 30 kilograms, which is definitely better than JB Weld, but nowhere near as effective as securing that bolt to the tank with welding or brazing. I decided to go postal with the last two transducers using a piece of metal pipe to see what it would take to tear them off. The welding had weakened the tank metal, so it eventually gave way and I was able to tear it off, sort of. For the silver solder transducer, I couldn't get it off. The tank kept bending and the middle of the transducer bent, stopping me from getting leverage. At this stage, I stopped trying because I think the point was made well enough. From now on, if any of the transducers fall off my cleaner, I will be using silver solder and high strength epoxy to attach the replacement. Silver soldering is pretty easy to do. You just need a blowtorch like this, some silver solder, and you may want to grab some flux as well, but that's not essential. If I'd have used this method from the start, I would have saved myself a lot of headache. I also reverted back to the original drivers I purchased. Even though the new ones looked to be made better, they failed way too easily. The makers of the drivers recommended I pair them with their transducers, so they clearly placed the blame on the transducers I got from the other company. And I can't really argue with that because they're the only transducers I've tested. I also found the 3D printed cooling box way too impractical. With all the testing and checking I was doing, it was just a pain getting regular access to the drivers. So instead, I made this little cooling arch. It places the fans directly above all the heat sinks and manages to halve the driver operating temperature while they're running. And finally, we have this a temperature monitor for the ultrasonic drivers. I'd been monitoring the temperature of the drivers one at a time using an off-the-shelf outdoor thermometer when a viewer suggested the idea of using an Arduino with some temperature sensors attached. I'd never worked with Arduino before, but I decided to take the plunge. If you're an Arduino fan or are interested in trying Arduino, I have a video coming shortly that goes through building this device from scratch. All up, this cost me about 100 Australian dollars in parts. I went with an Arduino Mega 2560, which is probably overkill, but I wanted lots of inputs and outputs to allow for further expansion, such as AC current monitoring, and maybe even a thermostatically controlled heater for the tank. I have an LM335Z temperature sensor stuck to the heatsink of each of the four drivers, and they feed back into the Arduino. This display on the right shows me the live temperature of each driver in Celsius, as well as a bar graph. I also rig this up to a mains power relay, so that if the temperature of one of the drivers goes above a particular threshold, it will automatically shut off the cleaner for five minutes, allowing everything to cool down. After building this, I had to ask myself, why on earth am I still using an analog timer mechanism? So I also built in a countdown timer. I can set the time using the plus and minus buttons. One thing that was really annoying about the analog timer is that there was no way to override it once it was counting down, but the digital controls allow me to switch off the cleaner at any time. 
I also have these four buttons at the bottom that allow me to set the shutdown threshold. They are 40, 50, 60 and 70 degrees Celsius respectively. With the new cooling in place and the faulty transducers removed, the drivers generally sit around 35 degrees C when operating. So I typically set the threshold to 50 degrees C. When I consider that I was getting temps running away near 80 degrees Celsius from these very same drivers before, I do consider the stability of the cleaner greatly improved. I received an interesting suggestion in the video comments, and that was to purchase a large off-the-shelf ultrasonic cleaner and then just use the innards for my own cleaner. Use the drivers, the timer, controller, heater and thermostat. I would have to buy my own transducers as I wouldn't be able to transfer them from one tank to the other without damaging them. But other than that, it was a very sound idea. Of course, I would never have considered this to begin with because my objective was always to try and build this cleaner cheaper than buying a new one, rather than outlaying the cost of a cleaner plus the cost of my large tank. But with the benefit of hindsight, it probably would have been a convenient option. But I still would have faced the same voyage of discovery with attaching the transducers to the tank. One other thing I must address from my first video is that some people got upset that I didn't provide wiring diagrams. I mean really upset. So here they are. As usual, no responsibility can be taken if you follow this and something goes horribly wrong. So I finally feel qualified to provide proper advice on building your own ultrasonic cleaner. Without a doubt, the most important thing is the permanent attachment of those transducers. And I now have a fairly straightforward method of doing so with silver soldering. Combine that with some effective cooling of the drivers and you'll have an ultrasonic cleaner that will be able to consistently do what it was meant to do. In fact, now I want to build another one. If you have any questions or suggestions, please leave them in the comments. And thanks for watching.